11.30 a.m. A military aircraft flies at low altitude over the church precinct. 11.43, another aircraft along a similar flight path. 11.45, it happens again. 11.54, the plane circles for a fourth time at low altitude. Forty-four, the building collapses. This is the Synagogue Church of All Nations. It's a Sunday morning, it's packed full of people and surrounded by the synagogue is a number of hostels, a number of accommodation facilities for people who come to the church. It is literally 20 meters away from where the building collapsed on the 12th of September back in 2014. The building precinct is heavily guarded 24 hours a day. Apart from some of the initial rubble being removed, the site has not been touched since the incident happened. There are two very opposing theories on what happened on the 12th of September 2014. Here we are outside uh, the Synagogue Church of All Nations. It is a Sunday morning here, so a busy, busy time here uh, on the streets of Lagos. And uh, we're standing literally uh, at uh, the uh, scene uh, where almost exactly a year ago, uh, the, this building, the guest house outside the Synagogue Church of All Nations, 118 people lost their lives and also uh, including 85 South Africans. So uh, we're here now and we wanted to just talk uh, uh, to one of the guys who uh, set up or wrote a paper uh, talking about um, the reasoning, the possible reasoning behind what happened that day, uh, that uh, infamous day, uh, Paul Iganiwe is uh, standing, uh, standing with me now and he, he published a journal uh, talking about uh, the concept of uh, infrasonic weapons. And so he's going to maybe take me through the site, he's studied the site closely uh, in the days literally and weeks uh, after the incident and he's going to run me through uh, what his sides are and, and the basis of his paper uh, that uh, he wrote uh, telling us a little bit about it. Paul, uh, welcome to ANN7, thanks very much obviously for joining us. Uh, just run us through what your sort of basic findings were uh, when you first came to the scene. I haven't gone uh, studied the CCTV. I discovered that uh, those planes, I don't know if it's the same plane, but the plane kept flying over where we are standing now, the building was here, and it flew for four different times. And uh, from the analysis of the video, I discovered that after the fourth time the plane flew over, 30 minutes later, the building came down. About approximately 30 minutes, it came down. Now, the interesting thing is that why would the plane keep flying over the building in a manner that seems consistent of trying to induce or trying to fire a kind of infrasonic weapon, which, of course, is what I published, and it was accepted to, to be so. Now, having gone through that, I came to that conclusion that that plane carried an infrasonic generator, which consistently fired pulses of the infrasound over the building and it needed to give a complete or enough intensity of the doses that's why it kept coming back and interestingly immediately after the building came down the plane never came back again so let's assume that the plane was just on routine flying over now the building has come down why is the plane not continuing local structural engineers independent to the church have studied the site and gave us their conclusions. Anybody that watched the footage, you will see the, bu the building come down as if a slice of bread. You know, when you arrange a slice of bread, how did that bread come down? The, 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 a building of six story come down. Would that teach to left or teach to right? And be any such a failure. Number one, you have to know the, the point of the load, that maybe the weight of the building goes to that side. But this area, 
everything come down within a seconds. And so anybody that come here see glaring that the core room is intact, nothing touching it. And the other side, we see some chaos there. It's intact. We removed that one because of the rescue time. The theory of infrasonic weapons, I just briefly want to know what your uh, thought is uh, on infrasonic weapons and the damage that it can cause uh, to a building such as this. Yes, that is really where some science things they are saying if if they, 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 they if they plan there's something inside the building, you will see the chemical reaction on the outside. But in this in this case, we don't see any chemical reaction. But we are seeing seeing that when the the plane fly over four times because the building didn't have any signs of stress. It didn't have any signs of cracking. It's, the building stands firm. Nothing like slash cracking, whatever, or in the building. But after the plane flying over four times, within before 30 minutes, the plane come down, and the plane did not come back again. <laughs> The focus for the church is the government planes that flew over the building on the morning of the incident. The response from the government was that routine Nigerian Air Force training coincidentally took place that morning. Are you saying then that Nigeria, somebody in Nigeria, possesses infrasonic weapons that could have brought this building down? I wouldn't know if it is somebody in Nigeria or somebody outside Nigeria. This is weapons of international dimensions. It could have been that it was brought from outside the country, perhaps to test, you know. People do a lot of weapons testing and sometimes people are not even aware. I'll give you an example. Some years back, I've forgotten the exact dates now. The Americans were testing this same kind of weapon, another generic sonic weapons, in one of the islands. And you know what? All the dolphins in the in the ocean were dying and washing off ashore. And truly speaking, that's, that's not my business. It's the business of the government and the security agencies to ensure properly what happened here. Because mine is to show that this is what happened. And I think that I have done that with people who have never met me and who are better experts mm. In, mm. in this field. As you say, you're a scientist. Looking at how buildings get demolished, controlled demolitions, this looks almost exactly the same. Um, can you categorically say that there were no explosives found in this building and that it, it must have been done from the air? Yeah, there are, there are certain misconceptions that we need to educate non-scientists when we talk about controlled demolition. Controlled demolition means that it is controlled by humans. And you see, in using explosives for controlled demolition, you want to achieve an aim. The aim is to transfer the energy of the explosives into the building to bring down the building. Now what happened here is similar in the sense that infrasonic energy was transferred into the building. It's just that the methods differ. In the, in the traditional case, you place in explosives. That cannot be done clandestinely. And if that was the case, there would have been chemical signatures that we would have seen. Like I said, the tent behind us now would, wouldn't have been standing. One time the building just came down, the building came down silently. And that is why I am insisting. And again, the way the building came down, the building came down directly vertical. The videos are all over the internet of how building came, comes down when it's as a result of poor construction methods or poor materials. Such buildings always tilt. But this building did not tilt. It just sat on itself. The coroner inquest set up by the Lagos state government to investigate the collapse indicted the church for negligence. The coroner ordered the prosecution of the contractors who constructed the building. He recommended that the architect and the contractor be tried by a relevant authority for criminal negligence. When I presented that at the coroner's court, uh, they, the coroner didn't believe that I was going to do what I said I was going to do. Because, like I said, I keep insisting. I am an, a scientist. I am not a member of this church. So far, I have not been a member. I was 
interested for the fact that this is what I was doing when I worked with the government. I had worked with the government in the Ministry of Defense at the Defense Industries Corporation of Nigeria where we, we produce weapons for the country. And that background made me to, to suspect that this is what happened. If the plane actually flew according to that label, will our CCTV camera be able to carry it? That is part of the question Corona failed to iron out before giving it rabbit. Were well, there no questions asked of where the plane took off from? Surely there are flight details. Every single flight is documented where it takes off from, uh, where it's, what's its purpose of its travel, who is on board. Um, is that not going to be investigated? No, they were unable to do that, you know, because the play had to do with military something. Nobody came to actually give details about that. They, nobody, we, we, they couldn't produce who the occupant for security reasons, you know, because it's a military plane. For security reasons, nobody was able to provide that uh, security aspect of it. Nobody came. That is part of the question. But despite that fact, Corona still gave it judgment. Another interesting aspect of the, the collapse of the uh, guest house here at the Synagogue Church of All Nations was how the building actually collapsed. It literally imploded. And uh, it, it, there's a number of issues uh, or instances of it on the ground here that you can see. This is a cold room right here um, that is along the line of the actual building itself. It's no more than two meters away here from this cold room and uh, it wasn't damaged at all. And uh, they've actually left it here to actually show you um, how sort of completely that it came down without touching anything around it. Um, it is bizarre. I mean, this is the line of the end of the Synagogue Church of All Nations uh, guest house, and this is a coal room, and it uh, literally hasn't been touched. Now, the Synagogue Church of All Nations actually own 11 of their own ambulances. This is their fleet behind me here. There are 11 of them, which uh, in some strange way were purchased a few months before uh, the 12th of September last year. Uh, generally, the ambulances are used uh, in the community and the surrounding areas just to assist uh, with uh, you know, sick patients or injured patients and elderly patients. But uh, on that day, on the 12th of September, these ambulances were used um, to obviously transport uh, injured in that building collapse uh, to the local hospitals. And uh, many people say it was uh, the prophet's intuition that uh, he knew that something was coming. And so uh, all of a sudden, one day, 11 ambulances arrived on uh, the premises and uh, they were used in good force. Uh, only one ambulance from uh, the, uh, the actual government, one of the government ambulances were used uh, that day. Well, I'm sitting here in amongst uh, the literally wrangled mess that is the uh, guest house of the Synagogue Church of All Nations here in Lagos. It certainly is a, a, an eerie place considering uh, the death that occurred on the 12th of September 2014. There are a lot of people inside uh, the building that didn't lose their lives and uh, a lot of staff members worked uh, in the building as well. Uh, I'm chatting to Ayu here. He's, uh, he works at the Synagogue Church of All Nations and we're literally sitting on the place where he was actually uh, when the building collapsed. He's going to tell us a, a little bit about uh, uh, that experience. I appreciate uh, your time. Um, run us through what happened that day when you woke up. What happened? Okay, just like every other day, uh, when it's time for visitors to have their food. So it was about lunchtime on that particular day. And um, I was probably getting ready, you know, making sure everything was in place for visitors to have their, to enjoy their food. So it's about lunchtime. And, um, I was busy putting plastic cups because having lunch they will need plastic cups to have water. So I was putting down the water dispensers which are probably stationed around the dining hall. And then all of a sudden I turned back with the aim of going to the next point to probably stock up additional plastic cups. Then before I knew it I just looked up and heard a, there was a sound accompanied with my movement. Do, 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 do so fast on the wall, went so fast, it didn't occur to me because being a very peaceful environment, 
you know, my mind was at rest and I looked, I followed it, do, 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 followed the sound and before I knew it, bang, it just started coming down so fast. I was standing upright, just where we are, standing up, just pushed me down, knocked me, back, knocked me off and I was on the floor and um, all I can remember, I blacked out. And by the time I regained consciousness, I found myself under a chair. I'd been pushed underneath. You know, I was stuck. I couldn't move, you know, to the left or to the right. Just stuck there, you know, surrounded with like sharp objects because the, the chairs and tables which are actually there had broken and they became sharp. So I was surrounded with this. And after a while, you know, because I had my phone in my pocket, the first thing that came to mind, probably try and reach people, you know, but there was no signal because everything had come down and all the beams had become you know, like a stumbling like a block, you know, barriers. There was no signal going through and everywhere was completely dark. I can tell you that. You couldn't breathe properly. Uh, how I managed, it's all by God's grace. I give thanks to God because from nowhere, as I lay down there, I just find droplets of water just coming you know, eating my forehead and on my lips and probably, and it felt as if I was drinking a, a ocean of water. And before you knew it, the visitors as well were actually also trapped there. You know, they were in high spirit. Dying itself was so motivational, you know, because the circumstances around us was not encouraging, but they were all in high spirit. And they were praying to God, which I did join them. Um, and before you knew they were giving thanks, you had a particular lady who was leading them in uh, songs of worship and praise. And I joined them, and from time, they would shout for help. And you get a response, you, you naturally feel the presence of people around, you know, running around outside, you know, making move. And time passed. Before you knew it, we were being pulled out one by one. And I myself, I was being pulled out. And like I said, all God, uh, to God be the glory, you had people on site who were ready to help. And I was weeks away into the ambulance and taken. By that time, I, my eyes were partially open. I was looking around, trying to observe what was around. And I was taken to the hospital and the recovery started. And here I am today, you know, giving thanks to Almighty God. How long were you there for before you were rescued? Uh, the incident happened at lunchtime on Friday. So Saturday about 5 o'clock, so it was over 24 hours. About, uh, when I calculate about 27, 28 hours under there, yeah. So you didn't move around, you couldn't move around, there was no space? Uh. There was no space, you were stuck in between. Because you can imagine it's, it's well laid out, you know, but the tables and chairs, you know, coming together, you know, it's just, there's no movement. So I couldn't really move my head, you know, like I wasn't, my head wasn't stuck anywhere. But I couldn't move around, I had to just stay in that position I was, yeah. Were you able to communicate with the other people uh, around you? Did you shout? Did people shout to you? Oh yeah, like I said, you know, people were praising um, the Lord and praying. So definitely, time time, you they're just checking everyone. Because there was a lady next to me, you know, I tapped her and she responded, oh, I'm still here. And um, it was even after the incident, she was the one who recognized me. Well, as you know, the uh, devastating effect that uh, the Synagogue Church of All Nations guest house collapse had on South Africans. It certainly was an emotional time. There were 85 South Africans uh, inside this building when it collapsed, which uh, raised a number of questions as to how popular um, the Synagogue Church of All Nations is amongst South Africans and how many travel up here. I'm sitting with uh, uh, Kulani. Her dad uh, passed away uh, in that incident and also Blessing. Uh, he's sitting over there. His mother was a bishop and she uh, passed away uh, uh, during uh, that uh, building collapse. And we're just uh, going to get maybe a little bit of insight into the families, how they're doing now, uh, how they were, um, and their involvement in the church at the moment. Uh, Kulani, obviously, uh, tell us uh, what transpired. I mean, uh, why was your dad here and how did you hear about what happened? My dad was here for spiritual upliftment. I came here, um, it was on the 11th of September last year and then the building collapsed on the 12th but I didn't find out that time I was writing my final year in high school I was doing my metric so by that time 
uh, we actually find out after a week it happened because I couldn't believe it. I was like, I oh, know it can never happen to Synagogue Church of All Nations. They're just lying, you know, newspapers and all, they just lie us. It can never happen there. That is the real man of God. Nothing can happen there. So that was what it was in my mind. When those bodies got to South Africa, that's the time I believed. But for my family, my mom was trying, was starting now to like, hey, maybe it's true, Kulani. Maybe it's true, we have to accept it. I was like, uh uh, no, no. And it actually, even the time from when they came to South Africa, that time the God was writing my final uh, uh, exam. Mm. I had to write that exam and we had to bury my father. That day, the God here, I was writing my exam. And then on the other day, I was also writing paper two of the same paper. But glory be to God, that paper, I got a distinction in it. Before my mom left, I was at school doing my matric. And the day before she left, um, she, met, she left a message um, to the whole family. I was in there. Um, she said to my sister, um, I'm going right now. Um, and if I don't come back, just look after the kids. Make sure um, they do well at church. And uh, my kids should um, do very well in school. And yeah, God will be with you. So then, um, after the incident had happened, I then remember that my mom would usually talk about such a day that would come. And she'd always tell us that when a day like this comes, you should know that I'm going to my comfort zone. You should rejoice. Don't start complaining and everything. Where I'm at is where um, God has assigned me to be. So, yeah. Do you ever question what happened? Well, everything happens for a reason. I don't question what happened because I know that my mom came here for a good reason. As we all know that this is the arena of liberty. She had came here to seek God's presence, to experience the love of God. And she'd usually come here, go back home um, with her life changed. You know, things would just turn around for everyone, not only for our families, but for other families out there. So she played a very important role in in influencing or in teaching other people out there to see God first and yeah. Well, as we mark one year since the devastating building collapse here at the Synagogue Church of All Nations, more questions than answers remain. The coroner says that it was a structural defect, but the church is sticking to their guns, saying that it was infrasonic weapons that brought this building down. The truth of the story is that 85 South Africans lost their life in this devastating attack. I'm Peter van Onselen in Lagos for 8 and 7.